This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. The carbon tax is slated to rise on Monday. That has been a major campaigning point for the federal conservatives. And today, leader Pierre Polyev is in Winnipeg trying to harness some of that public frustration. For more on this, we're joined now live by the CBC's Ian Fraze from downtown Winnipeg. Ian, what's happening tonight? Yeah, Pierre Poliev has brought his Spike the Hike axe attacks rally here to Winnipeg. It's scheduled to start in around 30 minutes. As you can see behind me, people are starting to line up. Uh, Poliev has been bringing these popular rallies across the country, trying to, as you point out, Janet, tap into that growing frustration around the carbon tax. It also comes as Poliev's own pol popularity is on the rise. Now, just over an hour ago, Polyev met in the Manitoba legislature with Manitoba Premier Wab Kanu. Only Polyev spoke afterwards to reporters. He says they discussed affordability. Now, in the past, Kanu has publicly said he believes Manitoba should be exempt. He's also asked to remove the carbon tax exemption on home heating. I asked Polyev if Kanu's criticisms around the carbon tax have gone far enough. First of all, I, he, he's his, uh, he works for the people of Manitoba, not for me, so he doesn't need me to be, he doesn't need my satisfaction. Uh, I'll say that right out of the, the starting gate. I appreciate that uh, he's uh, brought in a, uh, a gas tax cut and that he's called for the federal government to exempt Manitoba. To be clear, Canoe has not formally asked Ottawa for a carbon tax exemption, but the province is working on another proposal that takes into account Manitoba's history of green energy. Meanwhile, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Chrystia Freeland just happened to be in Winnipeg today. She was here to announce more grants coming for nonprofit child care centres across the country. She slammed the Conservatives for their anti-carbon tax rhetoric. We have the Conservatives out there criticizing the price on pollution without offering any climate plan of their own. That, to not have a climate plan, is a disaster for Canada's economy. Around the federal conservatives say around 2,000 people have RSVP'd to say that they are coming. Obviously, we'll see how many ultimately do end up coming through the doors. Back to you, Jenna. Thank you so much. That's the CBC's Ian Fraze reporting live from the Convention Center tonight. Students at the University of Winnipeg are scrambling to figure out what to do in the aftermath of a cyber attack. As the school works to restore computer networks by next week, it's added an extra week of classes and delayed exams. Those moves were meant to lessen the stress on students, but as CBC's Arturo Chang reports, many are still unhappy with the situation. All right. That's what happens whenever we try to log in. Arabella Kaysen says exams are stressful enough without having to worry about a hack. A lot of us, especially me, have many homework assignments and essay papers that are worth 20% of our mark, of our grade, that we cannot have access to. The first year student says she feels burned out by school. On top of that, the cyber attack is also having consequences beyond campus walls. In terms of the summer, I was hoping I could apply for uh, Red River Nursing. But because of this Nexus outage, I don't have access and means to find one, my transcripts, but two, uh, ways I could contact Red River. Students told CBC News the cyber attack is forcing them to put their plans on hold or to straight up cancel them. Armand Afridi says he had a full-time job lined up once the semester was over. Now that the term is finishing a week late, he's not sure how that will work out. Afridi says he's not the only one in a bind. Some people going back to country to see their families, you know, they, they have to like cancel the plane tickets or like they have to like reschedule the plane tickets, like, you know, it, it costs a, a bit of money. Other students say they've been hearing from people who can't access personal information, like tax forms ahead of the deadline. Marty Bloom says both faculty and students are struggling to figure things out. Bloom says she and others are planning a mass email campaign demanding administration reconsiders the extension. 
most students agree that they just want the semester to be done at this point because we're panicking knowing that all our information is possibly on the black market and knowing that they don't have to study for all the exams and write all these papers is just one thing that the university could do. On Wednesday, the school president said they hadn't found any evidence of personal information leaks. The school said if transcripts are delayed, they will send letters to institutions explaining the situation. Arturo Chang, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, a little later in the program, I'll speak with a cybersecurity expert about why universities are common targets for cyber attacks. As part of Winnipeg's efforts to make transit safer in the city, community safety team officers are now riding buses and patrolling downtown. CBC's Cameron McLean headed out with a team this morning and saw firsthand how they're trying to build relationships. I don't like what I'm seeing here. Early into his shift, community safety team supervisor Sean Berman has spotted a concerning situation. She doesn't look super comfortable. Berman calls for help and gets out to assess the situation. Within minutes, more team members arrive. They begin talking to both people to find out what they need. This is the kind of work the city created the team to do. It's been a little bit more than a month since the community safety team hit Winnipeg streets and started patrolling Winnipeg transit buses. And this morning, they took us on a ride along to show us how they do their jobs. So I've spent hours talking to people just to try to get them on a bus or off a bus. Former transit inspector, Berman knows the issues drivers and passengers deal with. He says he's noticed improvements. There's a lot of different factors to it, but since we started, I personally feel like there has been a decrease in people sleeping in the bus shelters. With 21 officers, they've focused their attention on downtown. But Transit Union President Chris Scott says bus operators have noticed the team branching out. I've had reports from operators seeing them as far away as Kildonan Place or Polo Park. So they, they are taking the steps to make an impact, um, improving safety on the service. But do we have enough people is going to be the question uh, in the near future. Passengers have begun noticing the team too. I, f I feel safe walking during the evenings at night and catching the bus. And so do, you, do you feel safer with the team out now? Or yes, you, are you always... yes. Uh, I feel once and they uh, help me up because oh. I can, can't get up by myself. Yeah. Why don't you come sit in our car, you can get warm and then we can figure out where we can take you. Over on Main Street, the team continues talking. The situation seemingly diffused. The officers will try to convince the woman to let them help her. You can't make people take help, but if you can help their situation a little bit, then as far as I'm concerned, that's a job well done. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. Manitoba's finance minister decided to put a, a twist on the political tradition of buying himself new shoes for budget day. <laughs> oh, nice. yes. Beautiful. Right on. Instead, Adrian Salad delivered an armful of footwear to healthcare workers at the Victoria Hospital. Five veteran workers received new shoes. Salah says Tuesday's provincial budget will show progress on some NDP election promises. The province is also moving forward with replacing that paper health card you have that gets all crumpled in your wallet. By this time next year, Manitobans should start getting new plastic health cards. Premier Wab Canoe says the move is part of a push toward making all medical records electronic. On Radio Noon today on CBC, Canoe said the backlog of thousands of people waiting for their paper health cards has also been cleared. This move to a plastic health card and some of the database work that goes on along with that is going to be a step towards other investments in modernizing the technology that we have in our healthcare system with a goal to making it better serve you, the patient. Canoe says details around the cost of these new plastic cards will be made clear in Tuesday's budget. But he says the money is there. It was already earmarked for this and there's no new cost. An Ottawa-area woman is the first in Canada to receive an experimental therapy which was developed right here in Winnipeg. The treatment is called phage therapy, and while it's currently not available outside of clinical trials, researchers hope this case will change that. Karen Pauls reports. 
Are you ready for your next dose? Dr. Marisa Azad gives 79-year-old Tia Turcotte a dose of the phage therapy designed to attack the bacterial infection that resulted from hip replacement surgery. The infection had become resistant to most antibiotics, and Turcotte had developed a severe toxicity to the only one that still worked. Doctors were recommending amputation. This is probably one of the worst uh, periprosthetic joint infections I'd encountered in my career. I was extremely limited in what we can do to treat her, and really, this was the end of the line. So she suggested phage therapy. It's experimental and not available outside of clinical trials. Phages are viruses that only infect bacteria, injecting their genetic information inside, creating more of themselves until they burst out, looking for more bacteria to kill. So this was my last resort. I had no other choice. It was do or die. Health Canada authorized a rare single patient clinical trial. What you can see here is this is the bacterial colonies. Samples of the bacteria infecting Turcotte were sent to Stephen Terrio. He and his team used that to create a phage specifically for Turcotte. What we do is ensure that our bacteria phage that we do use is killing the patient's bacteria at a, a very high level, so 100% or 98%, making sure that we get rid of that bacterial infection, creating a solution for patients that don't have any solutions because of antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic resistance. Turcotte's body is responding well. I'm just so happy to be here, to be able to be with my family, with my children, my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I have a lot to live for. Terrio says that's the reason he got into science. Once we get the government sort of to understand how phages are so beneficial, we're going to have a new therapy for patients, which is going to be amazing. Azad says she's already planning for another clinical trial. A lot of the patients that I see with these infections, they have severe depression. Some patients have amputations, chronic pain. It's a terrible quality of life. And for me to be able to say, you know what, there's hope, that's, that's worth more than anything. You did it, all done. <laughs> all finished. For Tia Turcotte and her family, it's worth everything. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. The latest numbers from the province show the wait times for MRIs at three Winnipeg hospitals got longer in January than they were last year. It was a most dramatic growth at the Health Sciences Centre, where the wait time grew by 14 weeks, from a wait of 23 weeks to 37. The association representing medical radiation technologists calls that number startling. It says more staff are needed to fight the growing wait list and the burnout among technologists who put in extra shifts. The Canadian Association of Medical Radiation Technologists says staff are feeling the strain. We feel a sense of responsibility for it. Like we don't want patients to wait longer than they have to. We're contributing to, to the burnout of ourselves by wanting the best for our patients and by continuing to take overtime shifts in order to fill you know night shifts that are voluntary to get patients a scan they need quicker. Dana McTaggart says she hopes the province allocates funding in its upcoming budget for more technologists, more education and retention. They have not been manufactured since the 1970s, but bombardiers are still being used every winter in Manitoba's Interlake. CBC's Emily Brass visited the fishing community of St. Laurent as part of CBC's series Communities in Focus. They look part snowmobile, part magic bus. There are so many bombardiers in St. Laurent, they're part of the community's identity. Some people call us the capital of bombardiers and, and also, you know, the Métis capital of at least the country. And there's probably somewhere around the 40, 40 or 50 of them, I'm told. So you come to St. Laurent, you're going to see some bombardiers. The big machines can be spotted all over the rural municipality and they even have their own road signs. So why are they so popular here? The bombardiers are, are really important because uh, the main industry here is actually fishing. Bombardiers can take people where other vehicles won't go. 
it's not very modern here, so it's, it's an older one, but uh, yeah, here's a dash and it has all the switches, all the gauges, all the gauges work and everything. Mike Chartrand is a commercial fisherman born and raised in Saint Laurent. Uh, I've been around this since I was a kid. So my dad was had one when I was a kid already and I was always hanging around and was just learn as I go, right? Bombardiers are spacious with a wood stove to keep you warm. Important when you spend your days ice fishing. Sounds like it's running great. I can't wait. Here I go. It is comfortable. Just slam it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Mike took us for a tour to show us how bombardiers are used here in St. Laurent. He took us out onto frozen Lake Manitoba to check his nets, reopening the holes with an auger and a shovel. I'm being put to work. I'm going to shovel down to the hole right there. Oh, it's harder than it looks. <laughs> Ooh, there's that water. We pulled and pulled on the nets, bringing in a small catch. Oh, there we go. A sucker. Yeah. And so these are good for eating? Yeah, you can can them. Yeah, you can can them like a but they don't, salmon. They don't do like they do, like, you wouldn't fry it up like you would. No, pick you, 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 okay. you can it like salmon. Okay. You can it like salmon. I gotcha. We also caught some pickerel or walleye, the most desired fish on the lake. Then it was back across jagged ice and stiff snow banks with Mike behind the wheel, steering the bombardier safely back to his yard. In Manitoba, bombardiers are known as the ultimate ice fishing machine, but they were invented back in the 1930s for a different reason. The first bombardier was designed in Quebec by Joseph Armand Bombardier in 1937. He got the idea after his child died during a blizzard. The family couldn't reach the hospital in time because in those days there was no public snow clearing of roads. The snow coaches were initially used as school buses and ambulances and for delivering mail and supplies. Mass production began during the 40s when the coaches were used for wartime needs. By the end of that decade, municipal snow clearing became the norm and sales dropped dramatically. Attention shifted to Bombardier's newer invention, the Skidoo, and the company stopped making snow coaches in the late 70s. These doors are brand new, they're just made. I bought them, I don't bloody made them for me, right? These are brand new. The bombardiers that are still around need to be maintained like Mike's 1957. The belting, make sure it's not all cracked up and worn out too much, right? So you gotta keep an eye on that. And then you got the cleats, you also wanna see if there's not too much wear or they're starting to break, then you might have to change some of them, right? Mike only buys new parts, many of them custom made. The engine is a brand new Chevy V8. If you're a handy person and you can do a lot of work yourself, good. But if you've got to pay somebody to put it all together and get the parts, the parts are expensive. But for Mike, all the money and work is worth it since the connection to the lake and his culture is invaluable. Emily Brass, CBC News, St. Laurent, Manitoba. It's a great story. Thank you so much, Emily. If you grew up on a farm or a First Nation, the video in this next story may not bother you. It's just reality. But sensitive or young viewers, especially animal lovers, could find this very upsetting. Educators in the Interlake say trapping is an important part of our heritage worth preserving. As part of our Communities in Focus series, CBC's Bryce Hoy visited high schoolers in Ashern last week. They were learning how to skin coyotes that had been donated by a local trapper as part of a land-based program. Now again, you may find some of these images graphic. There's a variety of reactions. Um, some students aren't so fond of it. Some students are right into it. A lot of students have been exposed with these northern communities, so they're, they're really interested in learning themselves how to do it. Connection to the land is incredibly important. Uh, we have uh, just under 50% of our students identify as either First Nation or Métis. And we also have this really rich history where we have uh, folks who've immigrated to the area about 100 years ago, and they've worked on the land here as farmers. And the land is 
it's a place where we can come together, uh, students can learn together, they can appreciate each other, and it's about connecting with our past, our history. Cut around his foot. Yeah, so you could, you could just pull our arm, just so very carefully, yeah, use the knife and separate. So Nahani, where are you from? Hello, uh, Saskatchewan First Nation, certified uh, trapper, 17. I grew up learning how to hunt. I shot my first deer when I was 13. I would probably try in for a land-based coordinator on my reserve, but I have multiple cousins and I would teach them. It's probably what my dad would want anyways, to carry on, the, like I said, the legacy and the knowledge of what I know about hunting and providing for your family at a young age. These traditions are dying out fast. It's important for us to learn them and then pass them down to our youth as well. They don't have the opportunity at home, all of them, so it's nice for them to have the option to learn at school. We are heading into what for many of us is a long weekend. Riley Lechek, his weather he's about to tell us about is, is very important to so many people. Yes, very important long weekend forecast, Janet. And of course, uh, Easter happening on Sunday, uh, which we'll, we'll get to Easter. There's a little ways to get there yet. There's a bit of a winding path. We'll call it that. But, a winding uh, path, okay. We'll, we'll start with the Easter forecast. We'll, we'll get that right out of the hop here because, yes, if you're doing anything like an Easter egg hunt or a, a walk or something outside, yes, you know, a fairly seasonal day uh, for your Easter on Sunday. Uh, three degrees, uh, the forecast high in Winnipeg, a partly cloudy sky, which I call exactly average for this time of the year. Normal high for this time of the year being four. But like I said, there is a little bit of a winding path in order to get to that seasonal high of four, which we'll, we'll get into. So mainly sunny across um, pretty much all of Manitoba today. We are starting to see a little bit of cloud cover and uh, some precipitation moving in from Saskatchewan into western Manitoba. This setting up for uh, this uh, Alberta clipper that I was talking about for the last couple of days now starting to move into Manitoba. So you can see by 8 o'clock in the morning the leading edge of that snow starting to make its way into the parkland region and a little bit more snow into extreme southwestern Manitoba and down into North Dakota. So as we get toward uh, the supper hour tomorrow, we see that snow beginning to move further north into Manitoba and west across the province. So Winnipeg right on the edge of that as we get to the supper hour tomorrow, but more snow back to the west still through the Parkland region uh, and through the interlake as well as into northwestern Ontario. So advancing into Saturday, that snow pretty much clears all the way out. Just some scattered flurry activity left through the Parkland region first thing in the morning. Otherwise, we're looking at a mainly cloudy day on the way for Saturday. Periods of snow, though, continuing as we get through the day, tapering off more so as we get toward the evening, but can't roll out some scattered flurries even as we get toward uh, the evening hours Saturday into your Easter on Sunday, which, yes, becomes a mix of sun and clouds across much of Manitoba again. So accumulation-wise, uh, yes, this model run has changed a little bit from the time I showed it to you yesterday. A little more in line with the forecast modeling uh, in that we're looking at a general 5 to 10 centimeters across southern Manitoba. But yes, some higher pockets through the Duck and the Riding Mountains. Um, Winnipeg in that about two to five centimeter range, but still about five to 10 centimeters across the Red River Valley uh, and into West Man as we get through the day uh, Friday into early Saturday. So looking at zero uh, in Winnipeg right now, uh, Northwest winds at nine. We did get up to one downtown today. Dipping down to minus nine tonight, still a little bit below seasonal for this time of the year, but uh, overall pretty average as we start the day on uh, Friday with a minus seven increase in clouds. Wind staying fairly light, northwest 10 by the time we hit the afternoon, and it's late afternoon into the supper hour when we start to see that light snow uh, starting to fall with a high of two degrees, three for Sunday, six and sevens for Monday, and you thought that was warm, Janet. Uh, some warmer temps uh, coming up in your seven-day forecast. And a very special dog as well. Thank you very much, Riley. Looking forward to it. Still ahead tonight, Ukrainians who want to take advantage of the federal government's emergency visa program need to arrive by Sunday. We'll show you more on how Ukrainians are coming to Manitoba ahead of that deadline. Also still ahead, people in Manitoba's Sudanese community are worried about friends and family in their home community as civil war triggers a humanitarian crisis. Lots more local news still to come. Stay with us.
Ukrainians are rushing to land in Manitoba days ahead of the emergency visa deadline. The program has already seen tens of thousands of immigrants fleeing the war come to our province over the past few years. CBC's Brittany Greenslade has more. Kitchen glasses. Pots and pans. There are boxes of donations as far as the eye can see. Everything families who fled the war in Ukraine might need to start over. Just on Thursday, we had 300 boxes of household items, hygiene products and, and baby products and uh, groceries donated. Since March 2022, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress has been helping them navigate their first few weeks and months in a new country. We, we have a job bank where we have approximately 250 employers okay. and we have matched over 400 people with jobs. But it's unclear how many more are still to come. The Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel program offers an expedited process for Ukrainians to live and work in Canada for up to three years. But the final deadline to arrive in the country is Sunday. You know, our anticipation is that we will see maybe a slight increase over the next few weeks of, of newcomer families who are, who are coming to our agency, specifically for, for services for children and youth. According to the federal government, more than 960,000 Ukrainians were approved to come to Canada through the program. By early March, almost 250,000 had arrived. The province says it supported more than 26,000 Ukrainians coming to Manitoba, with more than 2,500 arriving this month alone. We've seen um, a, essentially a doubling of our overall client uh, count over the last few years. Needs Inc. offers programming for newcomers to integrate into life in Canada. It says Manitoba's vibrant Ukrainian community has been attractive to those fleeing war, finding some comfort of home. The fact that there's an existing community here is, has been a tremendous support. Um, linguistically, culturally, uh, there have been um, sort of material supports that have been made immediately available through, through donations through the community. The groups both say there needs to be continued support for Ukrainians who've arrived to ensure they're given the chance to not just survive in Manitoba, but thrive. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. Manitoba's getting another crack at bringing in a record 9,500 skilled immigrants to the province this year. The federal government is again permitting Manitoba to welcome that many people through the provincial nominee program. Last year, the province failed to process 2,000 applications. That means the province lost out on possibly thousands of newcomers because each nomination represents one family unit. The NDP blamed the former PC government for not hiring enough staff to process the applications. Manitoba Immigration Minister Malaya Marcelino says the province will work hard this time around to process all nominations. It means a lot to many newcomer families. It means a lot economically to our province. So our immigration team is going to be working really, really hard to make sure we fulfill that federal allotment. Marcelino has pledged to increase the number of staff in the department. Look for an update in Tuesday's budget. The humanitarian crisis in Sudan has become one of the worst in recent history, pushing millions of people to the brink of famine. Manitobans from Sudan say it's devastating to see their friends and families back home struggling in hunger. CBC's Zubina Ahmed brings us more. The war in Sudan has triggered the world's largest hunger crisis ever, says the United Nations. Nearly 28 million people are facing acute food insecurity. 3.7 million children suffer from malnutrition, and over 10 million people have been displaced. Ruben Garang, president of the Council of South Sudanese Community of Manitoba, says he's constantly worried for family back home. People who are here, uh, you know, shoulder a lot of the burden because you, you have to do what you can, uh, you know, to take care of your relative. But also it takes a toll on you emotionally because you're dealing with the news constantly, you know, news of displacement, news of killing, news of death. So it's not, uh, it's not a good thing. It's a, it's a very 
uh, you know, devastating uh, news. Garang was displaced from Sudan in 1987 by the civil war before coming to Canada in 2004. He says most of his relatives back home are displaced, living in camps. People are struggling and they have no way out. The economic crisis is already affecting people. The, you know, the dollar value is up in, in South Sudan, for example. Again, is the local uh, currency. Uh, it is a challenge, and this is on the top of, uh, you know, the ongoing war, conflict. Goods are not moving from a region to a region because of the conflict. Garang says Sudan's situation is ignored because the international community is giving more attention to Ukraine and Gaza. Well, we know where the world attention is now, you know, and we know, like, uh, you know, uh, institutionally, you know, the world has not been fair. Mandela Quet came to Winnipeg with his parents in 1998 at the age of 13. Right now the situation is dire for a lot of the people down there. Security is a big issue. There's a lot of uh, challenges there. There's a lot of people losing their lives, not just my family, but a lot of other people's families. There's no uh, safety. There's no uh, constitution to protect the people. There's no rules of law. Quet remembers all the tensions when he was growing up in Sudan during the civil war. The moments of blockade where you had to present identification or present who you are and you know there were times where you had to stay home for safety reasons and you know there were obviously discrimination based on the ethnic backgrounds. There was always a sense of cautious and what you should be doing and who you should be engaging with even as a young child. Quet tries to help the community any way he can but feels disheartened. He echoes Garang's sentiments about Sudan needing adequate international attention. Zubina Ahmed, CBC News, Winnipeg. Some of the largest school boards in Canada are suing social media platforms over the impact they have on students. Four Ontario school boards are taking aim at TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook and Instagram. The lawsuits are seeking damages in the billions of dollars. They allege the social media apps are designed in ways that can be harmful to young developing brains, that they promote cyberbullying, harassment, hate speech and misinformation. The allegations have yet to be proven in court. Climate change can have a big impact on wildlife and their habitats. Coming up, we'll show you what that could mean for the animals we see within our cities.
Climate change means, among many other things, habitat change for wildlife. And that could change the variety of animals and birds we see in our cities. CBC's Emily Chung has the story. To make sure they're This team at the Toronto Zoo works to protect baby Blanding's turtles. We have the little guys up here and then they'll go bigger uh, down that way. In the wild, they're threatened by predators like raccoons or dogs. But there's one threat they may not be able to escape. Climate change is a very big factor for these guys. Um, it's affecting um, kind of their breeding cycle. New Canadian research reveals the animals we share our cities with may have to respond to the changing climate by moving in or out. The nature that we interact with is the nature in our backyards, it's on the streets, it's in the local parks. The research looked at 2,000 kinds of wildlife in 60 cities across North America, modeling where they could live in the climate we could expect by the year 2100. The amount of change is shocking, says this researcher. Seeing hundreds of species moving in, hundreds of species moving out. It also says some of Canada's largest cities will see the biggest changes. A warmer, wetter climate driving out some species while bringing in hundreds of new ones. This Toronto pest control company says it's already seeing a boom in one critter. We used to get maybe a few calls per year. People didn't even know how possums looked like. They migrated to, uh, to the north, you know, uh, due to obviously uh, the climate change and urbanization. Other newcomers are much smaller and bring public health concerns with them. I think we need to get much more prepared for the spread of zoonotic diseases that are always more prevalent in warmer, wetter areas. Big changes to our urban wildlife creates challenges, but the new study found we can keep changes less drastic if we do more to mitigate climate change. Emily Chung, CBC News, Toronto. Weather specialist Riley Lechuk joins us once again, and it's time for our new favorite segment. Yes, our uh, dog walking forecast, Janet, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with a very special uh, dog to show you this evening, a very oh, yes. special pup. So uh, let's show you, because I... yes, don't you like don't you like the sound effects? Just added today. It just just uh, makes the segment that much more cool, I think. So uh, here's uh, today's dog. Uh, this is Snowy, uh, courtesy of Jake, who I know is a very avid watcher on our CBC Manitoba YouTube channel, on our live stream. So uh, thank you, Jake, for watching, and thank you for sending that beautiful picture in just in time for Easter. Uh, you can send your pics to uh, talkback at cbc.ca, and uh, I will put them in my growing folder of pics that I have to show you here uh, on uh, our CBC Winnipeg News. So dog walkie forecast tomorrow. Bit chilly to start the day. We'll start to see clouds building in as we get through the day, but by about the lunch hour at the freezing mark, and then that snow begins uh, by the time we reach about the late afternoon uh, for us here in the Red River Valley, uh, a little bit earlier in the day uh, back to the west, which we'll get into. Looking at daytime highs from today, uh, Winnipeg officially getting to 0 0.6 degrees, so uh, I'm rounding that up to plus one this afternoon. Zero as well in Portage and Brandon. Melita getting uh, up to five degrees this afternoon, which is just about normal for this time of the year. A little bit of cold air still through northern Manitoba, but yes, we have seen that pattern change and that warmer flow of air start to make its way in. You can start to see these lighter blue colors starting to push back north. That was that colder air that we saw uh, for the last week or so uh, alongside that Colorado low. So looking at temperatures now uh, on the freezing mark in Gimli, Selkirk and Winnipeg, plus one right now at the Forks, plus two. Uh, in Morris at the moment. Uh, zero in Brandon, still five degrees. Uh, in Melita, plus one in Swan River, Barron's River at minus six. And uh, temperatures right around freezing as well in northern Manitoba. This is uh, about 10 degrees warmer than we saw at the beginning of the week or so. Uh, so uh, two below in Lynn Lake at the moment. Tonight's forecast looks like this. Uh, partly cloudy skies down to minus nine in Winnipeg. Melita minus three overnight tonight. Brandon at minus six and uh, starting to see some of that flurry activity through the early morning hours beginning through the Swan River Roblin region. Northern Manitoba still getting down to about minus 20 with uh, mainly clear skies of the night tonight. 
could see some flurries through Flynn Flon in the paw as well. So here is how that uh, snow looks as we get through your hour by hour on your Friday. You can start to see by noon we get that snow moving into Flynn Flon and the paw minus four in Grand Rapids, minus two in Barron's River uh, by the afternoon, a high of minus three degrees uh, in the south. Yes, starting the day with some of that light snow starting through Swan River, Dauphin and Roblin making its way further to the west as we get through into the noon hour. So mainly cloudy noon hour for the Winnipeg region and that snow starts to make its way in uh, by the uh, time we get to Friday afternoon. A high tomorrow in Winnipeg of two degrees, Janet. Your seven days on the way. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Riley. You're welcome. It happens far more often than we think. Cyber criminals launching attacks on Canadian universities. A cybersecurity expert outlines what those who attacked the University of Winnipeg may have been looking for when CBC Winnipeg News returns. As we've been reporting, the University of Winnipeg has not released any details really about the cyber attack it discovered on Sunday. It may have been a simple case of ransomware, someone trying to extort money out of the university. It may have been 
something else. Christian Loy Prest joins us now. He is a cybersecurity expert with the Royal Military College and Queen's University. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Janet. Why might someone other than a ransomware person or attacker want to attack a university in Canada? Yeah, so great question. And of course, it happens every day. Universities are very open institutions, but they're institutions that hold a wealth of research, a wealth of data, intellectual property. Um, and so they're always high value targets for generally industrial espionage, but in particular for adversarial states. So there's two types of these attacks that we see. So the Australian National University about six years ago was attacked and adversarial attackers, uh, presumably from China, exfiltrated pretty much all the data that the university held. So the Australian National University is a very high profile university in Australia, one of the top public universities in the world. Um, the other is that there may be a particular type of research project or program that an adversary is quite deliberately looking to target uh, and where they're looking to exfiltrate um, certain types of knowledge. The third is simply that a uh, country such as China is looking to essentially vacuum up as much data around the world as it possibly can and is then looking to um, to aggregate that data to see what it may be able to learn in this case about particular types of research. The final possibility is that universities are inherently also places of debate, of protest, and we know that China is very concerned about um, minority groups. Uh, uh, um, uh, we just heard testimony this week from at the Foreign Interference Inquiry from um, representatives of the Uyghur community, uh, Tibetan groups, Hong Kong democracy activists, and so trying to understand uh, their membership and their activity patterns in, uh, uh, at the university in order to interfere with those. Several university networks and services are still not available. What does that tell you? So it suggests that it's, a, on the one hand, a fairly uh, severe compromise of the network, uh, but it also suggests that the University of Manitoba realized it had a problem. The challenge is sometimes you realize very quickly you have a problem. In other cases, it might take you two or three weeks. When you shut down a network, it suggests your adversary got fairly deep inside your network, and so the only way uh, you can make sure they don't do additional damage or exfiltrate or destroy data, uh, for that matter, is to take down the network network entirely. Is it possible that this could have just been a student hacking into the service? Uh, sure. And inherently, when you're inside of a network, you're going to have, it's going to be more difficult to detect nefarious activity because you monitor traffic coming in and out of a network, uh, whereas you're, you're able to blend in with the traffic much better when you're inside that network. So it could have been also entirely just uh, uh, someone on the inside, perhaps someone on the inside trying to see what sort of damage they can ultimately do. Uh, do within the network. But by experience, these attacks either come from the outside, uh, and in particular, they often come through third-party supply chains, so through contractors that provide back-end IT services and that they themselves didn't do their proper patching, didn't do their proper digital hygiene. Uh, it's part of the problem, essentially, with, uh, uh, with a capitalist economy that security is always a bottom-line measure, and so often companies put the bottom line before doing um, a, making security the top priority within the way they handle their networks and their data. Christian Loy Precht, thank you for your time today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Your 70 forecast and daily lift still to come.
So yes, a little bit of snow as we head into your Friday, uh, taking a look at how that times out. Getting into the noon hour, heaviest accumulations generally through the Parkland region into the Riding Mountain region as well, but a general 5 to 10 centimeters as we get through Friday across southern Manitoba. By the time we hit supper time, that snow starts in Winnipeg and we start to see it really tapering off as we get into the day on Saturday. So minus 7 first thing in the morning, northwest winds at 10 Minus one, a mainly cloudy sky by noon. And then later in the afternoon is when we start to see that snow is starting to fall. High of two degrees tomorrow, uh, two degrees on Saturday as well with periods of snow and temperatures uh, up, up, up from there with a sunny sky on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe some showers later Wednesday and uh, nine degrees on Thursday. Well, the dog days, Janet, are over. They are. Seven <laughs> beagles have officially retired as teaching dogs from the Atlantic Veterinary College on Prince Edward Island. Their farewell party is tonight's Daily Lift. The pups are set for more play and belly rubs after careers <laughs> helping students learn basic veterinary techniques. The college is shifting its training methods so all its teaching dogs are off to new homes. They all graduated this week and were adopted by Islanders, including Claire Graham, a third year vet student who found her forever friend in three-year-old Brett, who she's been fostering for the past eight months. Brett's life is going to be one of relaxation, recuperation. Uh, he's ready for some R&R. &R. He's going to be going on walks around Charlottetown for the, at least the next year. Well, Brett was actually my first Beagle assignment here at AVC in first year. So we go back a long time. We went on daily walks together. He's really come out of his shell since we've taken him home as a foster. And I'm excited to see how he grows. So the dogs range from two years old to around five. Many of those adopting the Beagles are students at the college who already have a good relationship with them. The school has been slowly phasing teaching dogs out and moving to more like models, VR, and client-owned pooches. That's a good idea, yeah. and everybody has a, has a great long weekend, which and, we hope uh, for you. They get their graduation ceremony, too. <laughs> they did, and cookies <laughs> and celebrations. Have a fantastic long weekend. We have tomorrow and Monday off. See you so, Tuesday. See you Tuesday.